Whole CEO with Lisa G. I'm the best-selling author of The Boss Weight Loss. I'm bringing you the top tips to be unstoppable. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to actually pull up a chair with today's top experts in weight loss, mindset, and business. Learn our top tips to set you up for success so that you can have more energy, be fit and resilient, and feel unstoppable. And today we're here with Cynthia Lackner. Hey, Cynthia. Hi. Cynthia is the National Director of Psycho Psychotherapy Services for Health Six Fit, which is something I am passionate about too. Psychotherapist in the Denver area. She has creative programs, documentaries and workshops to help you examine your life, life skills and tools to diminish stress. And what a perfect time to have you on here, Cynthia. Right. It's always yeah. a perfect time, right? We're always dealing with stuff. I mean, but now more than ever, it just seems like our lives have become so busy that we're all stressed. And that's why I wanted to talk to you. Great. So happy to be here with you, Lisa. Well, this is because I'm happy to be here with you because I know to be truly unstoppable, we need to crush stress. So I want to ask you for our audience, um, if we feel we need to succeed in most areas of our life, but we have a constant battle with food, drugs, or alcohol, what is that coming from? Okay, so I have a private practice in Denver, and I work with people also all over the country. And what I hear all day long is that people feel really badly, even if they're incredibly accomplished. They feel like they're just never enough. They feel like they're not a good enough mom or a good enough dad, or they're not good enough at their work, or they feel like they're always failing. So what is the easiest thing to do when you feel like you're failing? Reach for something to comfort yourself. Right. I agree. It's that perfectionism in all of us. Right, right, exactly. So I have people that will say, you know, it was just a glass of wine, but then now it's a bottle. They admit that to me because I never judge. I know we're doing the best we can. Or I work with people that have emotional eating is a huge problem for them. So for example, I work with a lot of attorneys and some of them have more stressful areas of, of law than others. And this one woman, you know, her husband has suffered with a, a cancer and right now he's in remission but she's extremely heavy and she reaches for cheesecake. That's what she says she always has in the house. She knows she's not supposed to. So then what happens? It's a cycle, right? You go, you're, you're stressed, and then you reach for the cheesecake. Now you've got the same problem you had before, and then now you just say cheesecake and you might weigh more, and plus it's not healthy. So I work with people trying to help them feel good about themselves, and then we do something called emotional brain training which not that many people in the country know about, these are tools and skills to help you with those areas that you really struggle with. I love that because triggers are such a hot button issue because we all get triggered and it's all a matter of how we respond or react. And I deal with people as well with the overeating when they're triggered. And at the same time, I heard from a famous nutritionist that I interviewed one time, Dr. Golia, about how a cookie isn't going to change a problem with your husband or your boss. And, and in the end, a lot of us will reach for the trigger food or drink or sex or shopping or whatever it is. And the problem is still there, but then you also feel bad about it. Right. Right. So what I do when I start working with someone, I have them fill out this paperwork and the way they answer the questions, I find out where they're feeling like I'm not worthy or I can't do well, or I'm not enough, or I have to be perfect. And I, I all the time, I can't be wonderful and perfect. I can only be perfect. And so these standards are so difficult. And plus the unmet expectations that we have, that's what keeps us upset. We always expect someone to react the way we would. It might be a friend, it might be a partner or someone else. And we're always disappointed. And then that makes us depressed. So it, again, it's a cycle. And so what I try to do is get people out of that so that they can feel like they have a different path, not doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. I give them a different path to go on so they can actually live a different kind of outcome with what's going on for them. 
I love your tools and the emotional brain training. It really hits home for me. And I know that um, you mentioned about stress and triggers and um, how all of that isn't going to really help. And all the, it all comes from like the worthiness, I'm not feeling worthy or perfectionist or not good enough. And I wonder for our audience, do any of these topics like keep them from just having the life that they envisioned for themselves? It's really true. I mean, so many people say to me, I thought I was going to have a life that looked like this or that. A lot of people I work with, they might be divorced or they would like to be divorced or they're disappointed in their adult kids. I mean, I'm just thinking of some of the topics I've been on just even this week with some patients. And it just, it, it, you only have so much control over yourself and you certainly don't have control over someone else. So what I try to do is give people tools so that they can deal with these same people, but deal with them in a different way where they're reframing what's going on for them in a more positive way. Otherwise they just feel like they, they walk away from someone who might zap their energy and always they're always blaming themselves. They think it's not that, that other person, it's them. So when they feel depressed about what's going on for them, and they feel like they're not enough, I can help them look at things in a different way and give them new ways of even dealing with people that are difficult in their life who do cause them some, some real difficulty. The trigger people. I love actually the word we reframe. If, if you guys can just envision like something's in a frame and you just take it out of the frame and put it in another frame. And something that you've told me is that a lot of our depression comes from expecting something to be a different way other than it is. So the reframe to me, is that something you want to um, go a little deeper on? Yeah, sure. So reframing is something people just don't consider because most of us, you know, we're humans. And so we're just doing the same thing day after day. And so what's really fascinating is when I hear what the issue is, I invite them to say, what if we look at it this other way. And so it's hard to think of an example. I mean, if we had an example, then I could show them. But if they're dealing with somebody like their husband, and their husband constantly is someone who they feel is really criticizing them, there's a way to actually sit down with that person and say, here's what I need you to do. I need your help. I know this isn't what you're trying to do. But when I hear these words, I start to feel bad. And when you use these I messages, Lisa, it doesn't feel like an attack. What everybody hates in the world is when we feel like we're attacked because the brain goes into a stress response like, oh my gosh, someone doesn't like what I did or said. And so then that way, when you ask for their help and in a very gentle voice, when you say, when you do this, I feel sad or I worry, that gets them on your side to all of a sudden look at something and that's the beginning of reframing because you're trying to present something in a very kind, reasonable way instead of an attack. Now, when we're in an argument with someone, that's not the time to ask them to be on your side. You need to walk away and do one of the tools that I teach people called a cycle where they go through their emotions, where they can calm themselves down by rewiring their own brain and then I invite them to have that conversation with that person when they're calm. If you can think of any time in your life when you had a conversation with someone when you weren't calm, how well did it go? Well, that's not even a conversation. That's like an argument. And I love the emotional maturity piece that you're bringing to the table about having a responsible communication and keeping it in the I words instead of the you words. Because when you say, when you do this, you're an asshole or however you say it instead of this happened. And I was wondering if, if we could um, talk about it. Right. Right. And keep it in the, I feel, I love that first yes. party. Yeah. So that's really the way, you know, even if you're talking to children, you know, I took these parenting effective training classes when I was raising children. And the one thing they taught us too was to use I messages. So whether you're dealing with a small child or an adult, but what's the difference? There isn't any. When you've got somebody yelling at you, you are, you are looking at a three-year-old, maybe a five-year-old, but it's the same idea. So you think, do I wanna be right in this argument or do I wanna be close to this person? 
what's better for me? Well, most of us want to be close. I have more people in my practice who are lonely and they might even be married with four kids or whatever, and they're feeling disconnected. And so the way to feel connected to people is to learn how to talk to them with great love and respect and it's contagious. And then that other person wants to do the same thing back and treat you the, much better, treat you in a better way. I mean, there's so much in this topic that's just so important that you just talked about because I feel like we all are little four-year-olds, like certain people that we know on Twitter in the middle of the night, not mentioning any names, but it's just, it's so good to realize that we're all doing the best we can and that communication is the door through which we can get our needs met or get somebody so defensive that they are not even hearing you. That's correct. So what I do, Lisa, is I have them access their anger about a certain topic. And then after they've expressed that anger, because that's reasonable and anger is our friend. We don't want to be running around screaming at people, but when we can work with someone like myself or another therapist, you can get to the bottom, the, the root cause of that anger. Otherwise, you're going to be constantly be triggered. So let's clear it out. That's what I call that, you know, emotional trash. Let's clear it out. Can you imagine if you never emptied your trash can? What would that look like in your house? Well, that's what a lot of people are dealing with. They're walking around with all this emotional trash that they never got rid of. So they need to quietly, you know, close in and, and really focus. Think about the anger they have about one topic. And then that gives way to sadness, a profound sadness about that topic. And then what are they afraid of about that topic? And then the next one is guilt. Guilt is not shame or blame, but in the best case scenario, what do I wish had not happened? Or what was my part in something? Again, just reframing. So we're not about the blame, but we're thinking, oh, if I could have done it over, I would have done X instead of Y. And all that does, Lisa, is give you information about yourself and about that argument or that difficult topic and then from there, I ask people, what is your unreasonable expectation about that? And usually someone comes up with something. And then conversely, what's your reasonable expectation going forward? How can you deal with that topic? And people feel better immediately. So sometimes they're in that reptilian brain where they're really stressed out. And what, after we do this exercise, they can go up to the prefrontal cortex, which is the top of the brain. That's the analyzing planning and deciding, and then they can start to feel calm and make better decisions and have a more productive day, which isn't the worst thing. I love the tools that you speak about, about first, you know, processing your feelings and feeling your feelings before you speak out in the heat of the moment. And the fact that all of us have our subconscious programming that's running the show that we're not even aware of, and all of our triggers it's not about this moment. It's about something deep in our past where somebody did something that's not healed yet. And this person, your reaction might be way higher than appropriate for the situation. Isn't that true? Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of times we just go right to the anger and that's, and then that person triggers us and they, that other person might've said something that was really innocent, but because we've had this history with them right away you might say what did you mean by that why are you always criticizing me you know it's oh the always you're always that or you're never that that's why i love when we can use i messages when i hear you say that i feel worried or i feel sad and then the person really hears for the first time what the issue is and that's that gives them a snapshot of what's happening in the relationship and most people aren't jerks. They really do want to get along with other people. We're just talking about tools here, just tools in our toolbox. Well, for me, the reason why this topic hits home, just because I've experienced myself, you know, where I was in a relationship with somebody and their, my response to what they did was really about my past, not really about the present. Mm -hmm. My overreaction before I even knew anything about really emotional maturity and responsibility communication and just first party communication. So I love all of your tools because they can really help people 
in communication and everything in life is communication, isn't it? Absolutely. So whether you're at home or at work, there's, there might be people at work that you have difficulties with. There might be people at home. There might be family members. You can't get rid of your family members, a lot of them. So you're going to have to learn to deal with them. And you might end up really enjoying them. You just needed to, like we said earlier, reframe what's going on and look at it differently. And you might think, oh, I never considered that. I see where they're coming from. And then what happens after that, Lisa, is this feeling of compassion for that other person. And then that other person feels that, and there's a huge connection there. So I, I see this every day. It doesn't matter if someone's complaining about their coworkers, their boss, their partners, their mother-in-law. I'm just thinking of all these people that I've been hearing about in the last few days. And it doesn't matter. It's the same theme. Somebody has a different way of showing up, and this is what they're saying, and someone else has different experiences, and it's just a mismatch. It doesn't make anybody wrong, but it makes us have to go back and say, what do we need to do to go forward? What would be healthy for both of us? So it's a perception and it's, um, to me, it's just about trying to see it the way the other person sees it in, in a communication like that, isn't it? Absolutely. And so once you learn these tools, I only work with people like six or seven times. I'm not like someone that works with someone for years. I work myself out of a job and they're thrilled about it. And so am I because, you know, I have a lot of people to work with and I can't be with everyone always. And what's so freeing about that for someone is that they take the tools with them and they can use them the rest of their life. They just change out who the people are, what the situation is. Uh, it, I work with people longer if there's been trauma or if there's been addictions. Now, the interesting thing I want to bring up, Lisa, about trauma. So many people think, oh, I haven't been traumatized because I didn't fight in any wars. I wasn't in Afghanistan or Iraq. Oh, okay. Well, did you grow up in a home where there was a divorce? Yeah, I did. Or did you grow up in a home where there was a child that was sick? Or did you grow up in a home where you heard a lot of you know, fighting with your parents, but they didn't get divorced. I mean, I could go on and on. Actually, what happens is those are all traumas. They're little traumas. They weren't like where you were, my dad was in World War II and he, right next to him, somebody like blew up. I mean, it was horrible and he had to hit the ground and that would be really traumatic. But we can't negate the other traumas that we've all lived through. And, and in some ways we think, oh, that's nothing because, you know, it's not cancer, it's not diabetes or whatever. And so we minimalize that. And that actually adds more stress for us because we're thinking, what's wrong with me? I just had a little tiff with my boyfriend and what's the big deal? Other people have real problems. And when we minimize those real problems, like they're not real problems, it actually adds more stress. Isn't that interesting? And then we're walking around in that reptilian brain instead of calming ourselves down. We're making it worse instead of better. I know. It took me years to just really come to terms with all the trauma that I've been through and not just me, but everybody that I know. And at the same time, it's valid. So if you make what you've been through not valid, that's got to be 10 times worse. It is. It is. But a lot of times we do that because we think if we minimize it, it will go away, right? Wrong. It, nothing bad goes away. I mean, it, it just doesn't. It gets it, swept it, under the rug. <laughs> it gets, it's under the rug and then it starts to go everywhere. I remember this psychiatrist who I used to work with and he was so helpful. He said to me, you've got to get rid of things that you feel in your body. And that's why when I work with people, I always say, oh, you just said that. Where did you feel it in your body? And they'll say, oh, you know, I kind of have a headache or my, my stomach tightens, you know, which makes perfect sense or my chest or, you know, my muscles or whatever. And the psychiatrist said, whatever you don't process goes somewhere. So it's going to be in your body. And the problem is it's going to make problems for you. And so one of the classes that I have taught through Health Six Fit that you mentioned earlier is one where we talk about if you don't deal with your stress, you can have some kind of physiological problem. So it can affect your heart. It can affect, you could end up with Crohn's. You could, you know, there's, there's autoimmune. Three out of four illnesses have a stress component. 
this is what people don't realize. They'll say lower oh, back, like yeah. the skin. Every, right. I've I've experienced all of that. Right. And so when people say it's just stress, that really worries me. It worries me because they're basically saying, oh, it's no big deal. They're diminishing what stress can actually do. But stress can actually cause heart problems. It can cause, you know, heart disease. And it can cause so many different, you know, problems that you're going to have uh, physically and mentally. So I just like to be about awareness so that people really understand that as long as they ignore stress that is really detrimental to their physical and mental well-being well i am so glad that we had this conversation today this is why i wanted to talk to you because i feel like i know there's always stress it just seems like more prevalent now with the onset of social media and how reachable we all are and i know you prepared a, a quiz a special quiz for our audience to help diagnose this kind of stuff um where can people reach you other than the quiz too that's great. So actually my website, you go to www.cynthialackner.com, C-Y-N-T-H-I-A-L-A-C-K-N-E-R.com. And when you go on my website, you will see a tab that comes down that is a stress test. And you can just take it and see how you're doing with stress. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you so much, Cynthia. I really appreciate it. Any last words you want to leave our audience with? All I would like to say is that it really is up to you to make a decision to have the best life that you could possibly imagine for yourself. And don't settle for what you're living with now. So that's what I would say. What a wonderful thing to say. Thank you, Cynthia. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me, Lisa. This episode is brought to you by my friends at Bossell. Looks like a beautiful dress watch, acts like a smartwatch, so you can go from your workout to a dinner, screen your calls, track your activity, even your sleep. Share this with your friends for a chance to win a Bossell watch.